everyone. It's Tuesday, May 26th. We are in our sixth session of our um, continuity of our own professional learning series through the Chippewa River Writing Project. I'm so pleased that we have so many guests here today, including a number of you from uh, Dr. Amy Ford's class at Central Michigan University learning how to be English educators. So thanks for being here. And um, Andy is going to go ahead and get us started with our slide deck. I've got just a little bit of uh, intro information here and uh, we'll get moving right along from there. Um, as he pushes us into full screen mode, just so you know, if you don't want to have full screen mode, uh, you should be able up in the upper part of your zoom bar. There should be a thing for zoom or for view options and you can exit out of full screen and still see the slides and have more of your window space back. So with that in mind, um, we are so grateful that you're here. This is the sixth in our series of eight webinar sessions. Uh, I know on my social media graphic, I accidentally put the wrong date for the end. It is not June 8th. We will in fact be here on Tuesday, uh, June 9th as well. Uh, so we have two more sessions after this and We'll take a look at those in the upcoming agenda slide. You can see where we've been. All our session recordings are available from the Chippewa River WP.org slash continuity of learning. Uh, today, we are talking about learning how to learn online as professionals. And a few of the things that I think are pretty important, uh, these were questions that people had generated and shared with us. Um, early on when they were first signing up for the series. And I think they're worth just having on screen here for a moment because we're all still learning how to do this. Um, even though our school year of remote learning may be coming to a close here in the next few weeks, or it may already be closed for some of you, um, we all still have a lot of learning to do. And these questions are still important and still ones that we carry forward with us through the series. So worth just taking a moment to kind of look at those. Of course, Zoom has updated some of the features since we first started and I have to update my slide here, but uh, it used to be all of like two weeks ago, you couldn't click on hyperlinks and now you can click on hyperlinks again. So that one's a little irrelevant, but if you always need anything, you can do a right click and open it that way. You're also welcome to save the chat at the end of the session. I do try to do um, a, a fairly good job, I hope, uh, of capturing all of the different um, links that are being uh, presented. And I put that in the blog post that you'll have the link to when I follow up on email. And I think Dr. Ford could probably forward that email on to all the students in the 460 class if we need it. Um, these sessions are being brought to you for free. All the teachers are volunteering uh, because we're all learning together too. Um, if you are so inclined and you appreciate the work that they're doing and you want to continue to support the work of the Writing Project, we always welcome your gifts through giving.cmich.edu. And if you are in a position where you can put me in a position to contact a curriculum director, a technology director, a superintendent, uh, instructional coach, um, department chair, someone who might make uh, professional development decisions in your district, feel free to share my email address because we'd like to do more of this learning uh, with people in your own school or district. And I think last but not least for me, we are now accepting registrations for our Remote Literacy Learning Institute, Promising Practices for Online Classrooms. In fact, Andy and Janet and Becky and a few other people on the call here today, we were just meeting for our planning meeting earlier today. We are very excited for this two weeks of learning. Um, I think Janet from California might even be waking up super early to join us for these uh, during the summer. So if you're interested in learning more, we'll have a link to that at the end of the slides today. And I think with that, I am now going to turn it over to my colleague Shannon and Andy to talk about learning how to learn online as professionals. Great. Thank you so much, Troy. Um, Shannon, do you want to get started first or would you like me to introduce myself first? Well, I can introduce myself since I'm on the left there. Um, I'm Shannon Oswald. I teach middle school language arts and math at Central Montcalm um, in the middle kind of of Michigan. Everybody's in the middle there. Um, I've been there, I think this is my, I just finished 12 years, something like that. Anyway, and um, let's see, I've been with Chippewa River Writing Project since it began in 2009, I think, right, Troy? And then 
I helped co-facilitate another time and I'm going to go with maybe 2013. <laughs> but um, I've been uh, part of the Chippewa River Writing Project on and off for, well, since the beginning. Mm -hmm. There's that. And I began this webinar series when we talked about ubiquitous access for uh, online learning. Cool. And I'm Andy Schimborn. I live in um, Midland, Michigan, and I teach in Mount Pleasant, Michigan. Um, I am a past president of Mission Council of Teachers of English, um, also a uh, teacher consultant for the Chippewa River Writing Project. I guess I, you would say I graduated in 2010, but that's when I had my summer institute just a year after Shannon did. Um, I am also a co-facilitator of the um, hashtag teach write, um, Twitter chat as well. We're now moving from Twitter to Facebook so we can have more slow, substantial kind of chats instead of a quick flurry of chats. So if you'd be so inclined to join other teacher writers from around the nation and in some cases around the world, um, we'd love to have you there as well. So we're going to do a little bit of writing to get ourselves started here. So if you have something to write with or write on, I would take that out. And you can do this in a lot of different kinds of ways. So I tell my students the same type of thing. If you have your own maybe notebook that you're writing in, you want to do your writing there, that's great. If you have a Google Doc that you kind of have open that you want to use for that, use that. If you maybe just have your phone and you want to just kind of have something in your notes on your phone, I think that would be good too. Uh, we're not going to take too, too long, but just a few minutes and then we'll share some too. Um, and I want to talk about this idea of a lead learner. Um, it's been brought up in a couple different places. I know um, George Kuros has talked about it and it's usually associated with um, being a principal or being an administrator, but I also like to think about it like this too. Um, as a teacher in your classroom, virtual or traditional, you are almost like the administrator of your classroom. In other words, you're kind of there leading, learning, growing, writing, reading, hopefully along with your students. And so I would argue that you are a lead learner as a teacher as well. And so like you, because you're here, you, you know, lead learners tend not to come to webinars, but since you're here, you're most likely going to be pushing your own thinking. You're a person who doesn't need to have the nudge so much. You're willing to kind of do that on your own. You engage in friendly dialogues online and in person. You're willing to take risks for the benefits of others. And you also empower others to help meet their own personal learning goals. Um, so for our writing today, we'll take three minutes. I want us to think about these last three questions. What are the ways in which you learn offline as a professional? So when you're offline, how are you learning that way? How is your learning offline similar to learning online? And then maybe how is it different? And then the last question to kind of think about is, why might online learning with other professionals improve your practice? So we're looking at a, a, kind of a three different pronged approach here. You don't have to answer them in any specific order. You can kind of pick one and answer it that way. You don't have to start from the beginning. Um, but let's take just, let's take three minutes and we'll just write to this prompt here. And I'm, I'm gonna be writing also, but since we're recording, I'm gonna take my phone out and write on there. So three minutes to capture some thoughts that you may have. Okay, writers, we're gonna take about 15 seconds for you to finish the thought that you may have. Just like I tell my students that may be finishing up a sentence, maybe finishing up the last question, that may also be, and a lot of writers would argue to just stop in the middle of a sentence too, because that helps you to pick up your thought afterwards and continue it should you choose to do that. I'm curious, and this always makes me a bit nervous because whenever you ask, would someone like to share, adult learners are not that much different than high school learners and that there are lots of crickets. So I don't know if I have a friend who might be willing to share. And I see, oh boy, Dr. Ford, are you willing to share with us today? I didn't catch that. You can also try spelling it. Siri wants to help. Sorry about that. <laughs> At first, I thought it was you. I was like, whoa, that's weird. Um, I can share. So, and I think this is going to be relevant for all of my students who are, would normally be in classrooms doing their pre-student teaching with teachers like you, Andy. Um, I learn a lot from visiting teachers' classrooms and having conversations with practicing teachers about their work they're doing. And 
Um, without that opportunity for this semester, I find that I'm looking online for these experiences and I found these webinars to be really insightful and just bringing, trying to bring the voices of teachers and what they're doing into our course has been one of the ways that I've tried to transfer that offline learning to online learning. And it's got its affordances, but also its limitations, I think. Yeah, thank you. I like how you talked about bringing um, other teacher voices in because that's all we're trying to do too, even as experienced or veteran teachers, being able to hear other teachers, maybe more experienced, maybe less experienced, offers new insights and windows into what this whole practice looks like. So um, let's give Dr. Ford a little bit of a silent applause, if you will. I know that feels kind of weird, but it's nice to be able to do. And I've learned that too, that that um, silent applause helps people who may have uh, differing abilities feel like they can be connected as well. So our main topic here, thinking about growing as um, online as professionals, uh, Teach Thought had, had a web uh, a blog post with this specific image. And when Shannon and I were talking about it, we, the two of us, and I'm not gonna speak for you, Shannon, but we gra gravitated toward that heart. We gravi gravitated right towards that idea of humility. Um, it can be really easy, I think, sometimes to feel like you maybe have a good sense or control of what it is that you're doing. But I think when you approach something with a bit of humility, realizing that there's always maybe a smidge of something to learn, maybe it won't be a brain expanding epiphany, but even just a smidge, that helps you to open up to all of these other ideas. Another thing that we talked about on this uh, list of eight things that every teacher needs to grow is that whole sense of priority. And I think it needs to be your own personal sense of priority. Um, oftentimes, and this isn't anybody's fault necessarily, but oftentimes when um, districts push out the PD that they think that we need to have, that may be their priority, but it may not be your own personal priority. So as professionals, Shannon and I would argue, and I think a lot of people would, um, we need to pay attention to what, what are we prioritizing as teachers for ourselves. And that's one key way to grow online as professionals is you're seeking out your own goals and your own ways to grow. Not to say that district-wide PD isn't helpful because it certainly is, but in a lot of cases, it doesn't always meet you where you happen to be at, which is just like what we wanna do with our students. And then I think too, the last thing is this tree with all these hands, the sense of belonging, I think is really helpful. And being, whether it's a part of a Twitter community or a Facebook group or webinars like this, those places in which you feel like your voice is heard, where you feel like you're a member and not just a cog and a, and a, and a product, those are the places that we all sort of need to feel like uh, we're growing and we can do so as, uh, as we learn as professionals too. And to, to do this, Shannon and I decided we would kind of talk about this in two different phases. So learning is such a broad idea. And since these terms have been brought up a lot, we decided to frame the entire piece uh, today in this webinar under asynchronous learning and synchronous learning. And in our discussions, uh, Shannon and I, she kind of admitted that, you know, she feels a little bit more leaning towards asynchronous learning. She likes that a little bit more. And I kind of like this synchronous learning a little bit more. So we'll be hearing from Shannon talking about her experiences with asynchronous learning. Um, there's some definitions down at the bottom, just pulled from Wikipedia, but they give us just an idea of what they might, um, what they might be like in case you may not know or be unfamiliar with it. And we're gonna start with Shannon and sharing her story. So Shannon, I'm gonna pass the mic over to you. Tell us a little bit about what, it, what you're thinking as far as being an asynchronous learner. And why all that right. Too. So uh, first of all, I just, it is tough for me to be here. Right? Like I'm new to this learning online. Um, obviously we're all kind of new to being at home all the time. So, you know, a couple of months ago, I was really excited. Part of things I always wanted to try were going to come true. I could teach online. I could teach my kids at home. I could work from home and have my coffee on my couch, sit on the deck, whatever. I was so excited. I could have a window. I don't have a window at school. Mm -hmm. And the first couple of days were really great. I did all of those things. It was wonderful. I had 400 amazing ideas I was going to do. And then, you know, <laughs> reality hits and hey, um, everyone else is home all the time. They never leave. Mm -hmm. um, our house isn't huge. I don't have any dedicated space to work. 
Um, you know, all of these things keep coming away. And when they are up, even if they can leave me alone, you know, you're looking at your favorite people doing something fun or working and you should help. So for me, it became clear that hitting webinars at four o'clock in the afternoon are rarely going to work for me. Um, and most are in the afternoons. Twitter chats are in the evenings quite often. And this is what works for me. I can get up early in the morning. Um, I do get my space if I get up early enough. Um, the internet is usually not too bad for me in the morning. That's another issue with, I know a lot of people, we live way out in the country out here. Um, and another thing that gets worse and worse as the time goes on is I already have anxiety about phones. Video chatting is not my favorite thing, but it's okay. I'm getting used to it. But that anxiety grows too. And the thought of meeting online, discuss or share something, you know, can get a lot of people worked up. And so that's another reason that this asynchronous really works for me. Um, so, you know, I have to be able to pace myself, carve out that time when I know I can get it and be prepared for interruptions. And maybe I won't get back to it until the next day even. Uh, so I'm struggling. Um, um, you know, if I can't have that, that perfect time in the morning, uh, it's turning out that I don't work well <laughs> with all these distractions, and I didn't know this. So, um, I can do podcasts. I can do YouTube videos, archives of these uh, webinars that we're doing, anything self-paced, like um, a lot of software apps will offer you their own learning, um, Google certification. Those are all self-paced, and I can get to those whenever I want. I can pause go back to it, stop, go research something else, and not many of the discussions in real time, I guess. I know there's a lot of cons to that too, but I'm trying to be the pros of why I do the asynchronous uh, online learning when I can. Um, I don't know if I miss, does that tell my story of why I like the asynchronous? Anything anyone wants to add? Um, I also don't like to speak during meetings a lot. I won't ask questions very often, but I love the idea of being able to go through the archives and then still go in and ask a question from anyone in the group who's still on the Twitter feed or still on Facebook. Um, Andy's idea of the slow Facebook chat is kind of neat because that could be both at any time. You could get on there and be online with someone and not know it, but also just ask a question on your own time. Mm -hmm. So that's my story. So when you're creating your spaces, here are the three things I had to really narrow down. What do you want to learn about? There is so much right now. Mm -hmm. um, for me, one of the big stories, everything's in the air, not just everything for everybody, but I don't even know my placement for next year. It varies every year. Um, and I don't know. It's usually middle school and it's ELA and math of some combination, but I don't, I, I don't know what to learn yet. So narrowing down what I want to learn about helps me a lot. I know that I have to find something that keeps me very passionate or I'm going to really struggle because that when and where carving out time is so difficult that I have to make sure that I really want to do this. Um, and then the how I prefer to learn. Um, I know a lot of people love to watch videos for things and I don't because I skim it. I can't quickly get to the part in the video where the questions I want to hear are, are asked and answered. So I prefer to find transcripts if I can, um, find the notes of, of whatever webinar went on and look through people's discussions and their questions and answers. And that really does work for me. But then I also will take what I've learned and either talk about it with my colleagues, um, whether my CRWP colleagues or my work colleagues. I have uh, my best friend is a teacher in an entirely different district and we share a lot of ideas too. So I still do that collaborative learning, but again, that's even asynchronous. We learn on our own time and, and then share the ideas later. So there's my spiel about asynchronous learning. Oh, and here are some of the, uh, Andy, I got to give credit, uh, gave me most of these ideas. Like I said, I'm really new to this. I don't know what I'm looking for yet. Um, on the sorry, mosquitoes. <laughs> on the top left, the Ed Collab Gathering. Um, that is a wonderful one. I've already started listening to one of the sessions. This was a spring, um, I didn't think, entirely online um, conference, and they have 
archived all of the sessions. Um, and they're great so far. The ones I was looking at, all of the titles looked interesting. Um, but there was one I really liked about um, how to read scholarly research. Because <laughs> I'm still not very good at that. I, I don't have a lot of practice, but I thought that would be a really interesting one uh, to listen to. Uh, this one will stay up until August, it says, and then they will go back, or they were switching over to their fall agenda. So you can look at that. Um, what else did we have? What was the next one? Um, underneath that. The 31 days of um, indigenous, <sighs> black, and people of color. You seem to know more about this one than I did, but this is uh, in the month of May. It looks like they started last year. And every day in the month of May, another teacher who is either indigenous, black, or people of color um, writes a blog about their experience in the educational system. Am I right about that, Andy? Yeah, absolutely. I think what I like um, best about this is everyone gets a chance to tell their story. And there are some names that you may be very familiar with and some names that you may not be very familiar with, but they're all very prolific writers and thinkers. And so to be able to share their stories as Indigenous Black and people of color gives a whole different perspective, at least it did for me, because every day a new blog post came up and I got to not only know the person, I got to understand my place in this world as a teacher, of, 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 as a white teacher, to be very blunt and specific about that. And what it has done for me is it's helped me to be able to understand the pressures and changes that, um, that uh, indigenous, black and people of color um, work through, but that also helps me to understand the students that I have in my classroom too that may identify like this. Because, you know, it's one thing um, to read about that information, but when I'm helping myself out, I'm actually helping my students out as well. And what I like about being asynchronous is I can read at my own pace. A lot of times we talked about this a little bit, Shannon, sometimes in the morning before I get up, I'll grab my phone, <laughs> I'll see what's the new one and I'll sort of read that blog post for the day. And it just, it begins my thought process anew every mm -hmm. single day and kind of helps me learn along the way too. And what's great is you can also uh, spend time and respond and reply and to help educate yourself too um, in something that, I mean, let's face it, Mount Pleasant, Michigan is, is not, is, is pretty white. Our, our percentage is a pretty high percentage of, of white peoples, uh, but not necessarily that way either. And it gives me a new perspective um, as far as um, how, to how to be as inclusive as I can when it comes to ideologies and identities of the people whom I work with and the people whom I learn with. Mm -hmm. So that's a great place. So you want to talk about uh, Kelly Gallagher and Penny Kittle a little bit? Um, Gallagher and Kittle talk about teaching and writing. Um, it's just what it sounds like. They, uh, the one, the uh, links to the 30 sessions they did began right after most, uh, uh, most of the schools shut down and began on March 16th, the Monday after. Um, and a lot of theirs have guest speakers. They're usually around or just under the half hour mark. I like those a lot. You can, I really have to, I can do something else while I'm listening to those. Um, anything to add on that, Andy? No, they're just great. And, and being able to, being able to do it. <laughs> being able to do it um, asynchronously. I, I use my notebook, so I take notes as I write. Um, so that really helps me out too. And just to be able to hear two people not saying what you should do, but just how they're approaching these things, I found to be really helpful as a teacher. And the notebooking kind of brings me down to this asynchronous idea too. Um, a friend of mine, Michelle Hazeltine, uh, did 100 days of notebooking at the beginning of the year, and then it became so popular that she went to um, doing it and beyond. So this is her actual website, but you can go on Facebook too, and you can join uh, the Facebook group session, which is great because not only can you work asynchronously, but you can also work with people who, who just get, you get to share your work, share your raw thinking, see what other people are doing, how people are taking notes. Those things work them way into the classroom. I know for me, I was, I was practicing with, um, sketch noting and I'm no artist but it gave me a spot to kind of practice with that and that turned into something where my students say hey what are you doing there and I showed them 
and they asked me, you know, can I learn how to take notes like that? Because that looks really cool. So when you have a kid who's asking you how to take notes because of your crappy drawings, that's a pretty powerful thing because then they're learning how to teach themselves in different kinds of way too. And they get to see that this is what writers do, right? This is what I do. I'm, 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 as a writer and as a reader, we show those practices that we have. So 100 Days of Notebooking and Beyond is a great place to kind of have maybe a toe dip into some of these types of things if the other things feel like it takes too much time for you. So I'm going to move then from asynchronous learning to synchronous learning. And I'm going to ask us, we're going to actually do some synchronous stuff. So um, let me, I'm going to stop sharing my screen here for just a moment. And I'm going to add a link into the chat room. Let me grab it. And I'm going to ask if you're willing and able to. You can grab that document, that way you can pop into it. And while, I want to go back to sharing my screen because it's hard to sometimes describe something when you're not seeing it. I can see a bunch of anonymous critters popping up there. Uh, the link itself is just to the actual um, presentation that we're looking at here. So just add your name, find a space. I don't know how many people are going to be here. So if you feel like you've run out of a row, be brave, add a, insert a row below and then just add your name. Uh, first name is fine. If you don't want to add your name, you don't have to add your name. It doesn't really matter to me too much. It's just a nice way to separate our thinking. Um, and, we're gonna, and as I'm talking and as I'm sharing and as we are viewing and experiencing this thing all together in a synchronous kind of a way, have this document open so that you can take some notes for yourself. What, what is resonating with you that we are talking about? What are some insights that maybe you have for us right? Some things that we hadn't thought about. What are some potential impacts? How could you see maybe teaching and learning synchronously in this way impacting you? And since it's a synchronous learning environment, what I really like is, and I can see it really happening, is people can just begin to write right when they're, when you're thinking about it. So please don't feel like you have to wait for me to tell you when to write, okay? So just work your way through it the best you can. And if you need to add Another row, I see an anonymous hedgehog down there working hard to add a row, good job. So while you do that, I'm gonna move myself back to the screen here. In fairness, I probably won't be able to write as much as you will because I'll be doing some talking and managing my screen here. So Shannon shared with us her story of being an asynchronous learner. Um, I, can, I, I like learning asynchronously, I can learn asynchronously. Um, but without having those routines kind of in my life that I know that I can see people, it can fall apart for me pretty quickly. Um, I am also a person who I like receiving feedback and I get a lot of visual feedback. I get a lot of body language feedback. So right now, just to give an example on my screen, since I'm sharing, I really, I only get to see Shannon right now, which is great. And she's smiling kind of a little bit, which is nice. That makes me feel good. It makes me feel like I'm being heard. Um, but it also helps me too to be able to answer and ask questions right away. There's this push and there's this pull of information that goes back and forth in, in a synchronous environment that doesn't necessarily happen in an asynchronous environment. It can, it's just delayed. And it reminds me of students who like to play instruments, or maybe you are a person who plays an instrument. You can hear when your note is just a bit off key, you have that very quick chance to be able to hear that, and you can make a correction very quickly to improve your practice, right? Synchronous learning works like that for me too. Being able to work like this where we can converse as best we can, it gives me a chance to make those minor corrections just as quickly as I possibly can, and I learn a whole lot from doing it that way. Um, this reminds me, I think we have, uh, yeah, we got some time, good. We're gonna have a little bit of poetry. Uh, this is only about five minutes, so it's not too long, but um, synchronous learning does require a bit of, it re requires a chance for you to be brave enough and vulnerable enough to be able to enter into those conversations where asynchronous learning doesn't happen so much. So I'm going to be brave and see if this happens. This will work. I'll, I'm going to play Anas Majani's poem, Shake the Dust, here, and we'll just listen to what he has to say. That's all we have to do. 
Synchronous learning doesn't have to be about writing all the time. So we're just going to listen. We're not going to talk about it. We're not going to share. We're just going to hear the beautiful words. So let's see if this works. And Shannon, if it's not working real well, just kind of wave your hand at me. If it's too choppy or something, and I'll, I'll pause it and I'll, I'll move on, okay? You do me a favor and do some snaps or do some of this. That's really good too. You know, when it comes to this um, situation, we find ourselves with COVID and the pandemic, we have to shake the dust, don't we? We have to kind of shake loose of all of our anxieties and all of our fears and, and synchronous learning that kind of helps, helps us to do that too. Um, isn't that what we're doing as teachers? Aren't we cutting out pieces of ourselves to give them to our students, to help them learn, to help them grow? Isn't that what we're doing with each other? We're sharing with each other. And in a synchronous moment like this, we can begin to, to literally, in some cases, feel that. You can feel that, that energy that comes in a synchronous situation that does not necessarily come in an asynchronous situation. So that's why I shared that little poem with us. Besides, it gives us a chance too to reconsider what it means to have synchronous learning. It doesn't mean I'm talking as the teacher all the time. So from a synchronous process, we can ask questions in real time, feel a greater sense of community and connections that we have with each other. We become more engaged in learning and feel a stronger sense of collaboration with each other. Um, to create and integrate these spaces for myself for synchronous learning, and I'm not here to teach you Google Calendar. That's not my plan, okay? I know though, if I'm going to do something synchronously, I have to know there's a time period, right? So for us, it's right here with us at four o'clock. <laughs> I have a CRWP presentation that is to be with all of you. This is my calendar. Yours might look better than mine, messier than mine, cleaner than mine, more organized than mine, but this is what I have. So you can see I have a writing group coming up at six and my wife already said, oh, we only have an hour before your things. And I said, I do, but it also helps my wife too and my family because she knows that I do some of this stuff on my own and that's hard to know when you're working and when you're not working. So being able to share my calendar with her kind of helps our family because if it's on there, then she knows that I have something planned and I'm not just springing it on somebody. Um, I won't go through all of my calendar stuff there, but I do this because it helps me to explore, discover, plan, connect, network, and learn my way through things. Um, other spaces that do this too for, for me and for others when it comes to synchronous learning, um, some of these aren't new, right? Like Twitter chats have been around for a while. And I know for myself, it was really scary to go into a Twitter chat because I didn't really know what it was going to be like. And I didn't know even where to find them. And so I don't know if you've all seen this before, but you can, somebody has somewhere has compiled, compiled a list of education chats and they have them on the calendar from like now until eternity. <laughs> so you can li quite literally go and find, it's like flipping through the TVs, TV channels. You can find what chats are gonna work for you maybe, what is interesting to you maybe. You can schedule those things. So this, all these chats here, by the way, are just today, just today. You can see Shannon talked a lot about many of them are in the evening and you can see that happening, but being able to connect with people in that synchronous way, share your ideas is really helpful. Um, it's a lot of people would call it the best PD they've ever gotten before because you actually get to literally chat with people that you might see and think of as being large educational gurus. And that's exciting to be able to be a part of that conversation, to be able to pull yourself up to that table and know that your words matter too. Um, a couple other things that I find to be interesting too is uh, Facebook. And Facebook, I know, especially for a lot of our younger uh, folks, um, Facebook is like considered old people stuff. Um, but I'm mentioning Facebook because I had to do a transition that I wasn't really ready for. Facebook for me was just family, private, family stuff. Um, but I started taking a gamble a few years ago where, my gosh, you know, like Penny Kittles on Facebook. Maybe I'll toss her a friend request. That's kind of weird. Maybe she would do it. And she did. And Penny Kittle doesn't know me. Donna Miller's on Facebook. That's kind of cool. Maybe I'll send her a friend request and see what happens. I started doing that. And I started finding out that not only would people accept these friend requests, and I, I mean, feel weird saying this, but that's, I'm, I'm nobody special. So they don't know me, right? 
So to be able to have that connection, I got to see their insights a little bit more, but I also got to see a little bit of every day, their daily practices of how they operate as teachers in every facet of their life. And that's opened things up for me quite a bit. So much so that um, when I became friends with Kylene Beers and Kylene Beers and I have never met in, in person, but Kylene started putting on these things called office hours over during COVID, where she would have Facebook Live going on. You could participate in it or not participate in it, but you would get a notification and you could get some pretty critical PD with some pretty smart people. So Facebook Live worked out really well. Shannon talked about YouTube Live and what um, Penny Kittle and uh, Kelly Gallagher had, have done. Uh, Ralph Fletcher also did writing with Ralph, which I thought was just brilliant. And yes, he's working and talking about younger grades, first and second, but to be able to sit with my daughter and Ralph Fletcher and write together was amazing. Mo Willems taught us how to draw the pigeon together one day. So to be able to sit down and do that with YouTube Live is pretty fantastic as well. And of course, we know Zoom. We know the Zoom things that we can be a part of. We know the different things that can happen with those. But unless you're connected to some of these things, you may not realize that they're happening. So I would encourage you to integrate those kind of spaces so you can bring some more, some of those into your life as well. Um, other things, professionally speaking, talked about uh, Twitter chats. I know just this uh, Thursday, Dr. Mary Howard has her good to great chat coming up. So those weekly Twitter chats are pretty fantastic. Um, I would argue too, down here at the bottom, I say don't just lurk, <laughs> engage to learn too. Like we'll say things to our students like, well, you know, why didn't you ask that question? Well, why don't you ask that question? And for something that made me nervous to ask, I would always ask, I would always add the hashtag am learning to let people know that I don't think I have the answer, but I'm just taking it, I'm taking a, I'm, I'm putting my fishing pole out there, taking a cast at an answer and letting people know that I'm kind of learning along the way and I'm learning from you. And people are very receptive to things like that. Um, Shannon talked about the Ed Collab gathering. Uh, those can be asynchronous. You can do them post-production, so to speak, but you can also be aware and alive, uh, aware of the live conferences as well, which is fantastic. Uh, Teach Write Academy has a time to write sessions where uh, there, there I am right there with a bunch of my friends and to save some space, I added, I cut some things out. But all we do is get together once a week for an hour and a half. We see each other for a bit and this is kind of weird, but we write whatever we want to write for 45 minutes, really in silence. Not to, just to see the other people writing, to be in that room with other people writing has been something that's helped me an awful lot professionally to know that I'm not alone in my district or not alone in the state of Michigan and be able to have these connections with people um, gets back to that community sense, right? And it's become a priority for me. So then that becomes a priority for what I bring into my life. <clears throat> um, as far as students go, because I have a tendency to think that way often. Okay, cool. So this is good for me, professionally speaking. And I, I think to myself, if it's good to me, for me professionally speaking, maybe the practice is just a good practice, right? So how can I bring those practices that I feel like I'm growing from and move those practices right into my classroom? Some of these things you've seen already. So we've done, for example, the poetry. I have poetry every single day in my classes. And, you know, when we meet synchronously on Zoom meetings like this, and I taught today just like this, we begin with a poem. Uh, let me see. We are reading from Mary Oliver's Devotions. I can't see my screen, but we're reading from Devotions. And I love her poetry for many reasons. But one of the reasons I love her poetry, especially right now, is because she talks a lot about the world. She talks a lot about hope. She talks a lot about what it is to be in this place called Earth and thinks about the challenging times, not COVID necessarily, but Life on Earth has always been challenging to a certain degree. So to be able to talk about that without it being overbearing has been helpful and actually reducing, reduces anxiety for a lot of students. So inviting beautiful words is one thing I do. Another thing I do is, this is gonna look familiar to you, but I'm gonna pull it up, um, is when we learn together, even though we're in Zoom sessions like this, um, I'll have documents just like you might be working on right now where in this case, I have a TED talk that we watched together. I didn't watch it like we showed the video. I'll have us all watch. I said, well, it's about 15 minutes long, so watch it. We'll come back in 15 minutes, and then we'll type our responses as we go. 
Um, and so you can see students have kind of done that too. They follow the same type of thing. Um, and then as we work through, we get a spot to learn about this a little bit more. And we, we dive into 150 word response. We get to hear people's ideas, people share out a little bit. And it gives us a chance to feel, even though we are in separate places right now, we are in, we are in the same space and same place here right on this document. That works well for the students who are working synchronously with me, but not all students are working synchronously with me. Some of the students like Kendra and Celeste, for example, they did this asynchronously. They worked on it afterwards. So what I find is interesting is that students aren't like copying and pasting just what other people are saying. They're looking and it helps them to kind of give them confidence to write because they can bounce their ideas up what someone else is saying and be brave enough to put it down even on this, this type of a, a digital document. Sorry, sometimes my tabs get covered up by the, or my screen is showing and I have to wait just a moment. Um, the other thing I think is interesting for synchronous learning with students is, um, I don't know if you've heard of the quarantine journal project or not. Um, this was something that I thought was pretty cool because I do creative writing with my students or independent writing with my students. And I wanted them to be able to think their way through because I know that writing can be therapeutic. So the quarantine journal project seemed to be a useful thing for us too. So as you walk through, there's prompts and even just looking at this, I thought, hmm, Adobe Spark, that seems kind of cool. So maybe I want to use Adobe Spark in my learning and in my professional areas. So just using mentor text and seeing them can be really helpful. Uh, there's a prompt list, it was pretty simple, and this is what we did. And we would say, okay, here's your prompt for today. Let's take 30 minutes to write. We'll write, for, and we would write in silence for 30 minutes, and then when we come back, so what, what did you come up with? And we'd share a word, a phrase, or sentence. In some case, we'd share drawings. We'd share all the different things that we were thinking about. And um, st for the students who participated with me in this, um, what, we, what we experienced was that coming together of community that even though we can feel isolated from people, that that project helps us to all to understand that, you know what, we have these things that we're thinking about, we're worried about, that we're actually kind of even maybe enjoying during this idea of quarantine right now. Um, so just encouraging that time to write with each other in lots of different ways um, has been also helpful for a synchronous learning experience. So I think we're coming up near our end here. And you know, actually what I want to do, and I was hoping we had time to do this, and I think that we will. So we're going to try this right now, Sharon. Shannon, excuse me if you're ready. Um, I'm going to take a look and see what we have in our document. <laughs> And we pull that up here. There we are. Okay, cool. So let's let's do this. I think this is going to be pretty helpful. Okay. I've been talking for quite a bit of time and I'm being cognizant of time. So let's take just two minutes, two minutes, and I want you to choose one of those columns, either either the insights or potential impacts column and pick one idea, just one, that you want to elaborate on in about two minutes. So not both columns, just one. Pick one, elaborate on it, and then I'm gonna ask for uh, one, maybe two people to share an idea out. Okay, so two minutes to write, please. And thank you so much for all of those people who are adding their words to this document. I know there's nothing quite as maybe anxiety producing for some as just to throw it on an idea with a bunch of people that you may or may not be so familiar with. So thank you for being brave and vulnerable. Being quiet just to scroll through and see what we have. Beautiful, thank you. Okay. I'm finding it when it comes to Zoom much easier to ask somebody to share instead of opening it up. Um, but if you are a person who has a burning desire to share something with us right now, if you could unmute yourself and I'll give about 10 seconds to see if we can hear your voice. Otherwise, I'll ask someone to share. I'm going to kind of pick random here. It'd be scary. All right, cool. Um, 
Brian, I don't know if you're able to help me out. Brian Arbut's a friend of mine, so I don't know if you can hear me right now, Brian, but if you wouldn't mind sharing a bit of what your thinking is on this, that would be helpful. And I'll move to your screen, so. Hey, Andy. Hey, Brian, good to see you or hear you. You as well, yeah. Um, I, I've been thinking about this a lot and we're hoping to get teacher input on future plans for the fall. But uh, as I do think and reflect on it, I, I think uh, myself included, but the majority of our teachers uh, will have to get more comfortable with uh, making synchronous learning more than simply a lecture. Uh, I love the fact that you're including live writing in this. Uh, and I think it'll take a lot of um, openness to new learning for those of us in the, the teaching world, um, especially if we're, we're set in uh, our ways in terms of, you know, if we're not face to face, it's not going to work. Well, it's not going to, that's not an acceptable reality. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, so I think just being open as, uh, as learners, I mean, this is the time for us to model um, openness to learning, especially for things that we might not automatically have buy into. Uh, and that was what a lot of my comments were related to, uh, creating that sense of belonging um, and how it can be done through synchronous learning is something I want to get a lot better at over the next few months. So thanks for the great example. Yeah, well, you're welcome. So, you know, this is really about relationships, isn't it? You know, we talk about in our trauma-informed classrooms and lots of different classrooms in school in general, I think teaching can't really happen unless there's some sort of a relationship there. So we have to be able to, I think, help that relationship come through a screen too, right? Because, I mean, if we're just doing, you know, and, I'm, and I know there's equity issues and I know there's connectivity issues, but it would seem pretty challenging I'm, if, if I were to be a 15 year old student just receiving a packet every week because it's all I can have. It's hard to make that relationship happen that way. Um, so to be able to blend those things, I can't think can be useful. Brian, thank you so much for sharing. I appreciate you. Um, Troy, what do you think? Can we share one more or I know we have a few minutes left. Do you wanna finish up with some wrapping things up here or what are you thinking? I didn't take a moment to share more. I'm going to offer an invitation to the CMU students here in the chat room and uh, invite them to stay on after the recording ends. But yeah, go ahead and take a moment to uh, have one more person share out if they'd like. Yeah, I think that's great. So I, I'm going to pick some, I've already picked people I do know so far. So I'm going to take a gamble and go for someone I don't know. Um, at, least, at least I don't know. If I know, I don't think so. Erica R. <laughs> If you're willing and comfortable to share, that'd be nice to hear what you have to say. Okay, can you hear me? You can, thank you, and thanks for okay. being brave. Okay, so I kind of wanted, sorry, my dog's barking in the background. Okay. Um, so I kind of talked about how um, the educators are here, like veteran educators are here to help us, help the new students, I guess, like me coming up, I'm a little, worried about it, but um, I know that there's help when I need it. And these sources have kind of like given me a way to talk to them and just get help if I need it, so. Absolutely, and so one thing I'm really happy to hear is that you've come to something like this. So you have a room right now of people who are willing to kind of help you, Erica. Okay, you have a Chippewa River writing project or other writing projects, and that's what we do. That's what we do. We work to try to help you to do these types of things. And by you taking the risk of not only bringing your voice up, and it's great to hear your dog barking in the background because I have a dog too, and sometimes he comes up. Uh, my five year old daughter, during I had a day before AP test prep, and my AP lit students were working hard and working hard, and she came up with red lipstick all around her mouth. And I said to her, oh my gosh, you look so pretty. And she said, put her hand on my hip, came around the screen and said, well, I shouldn't look pretty. I'm a clown, dad, <laughs> which was even more wonderful, right? So she had all this stuff all over. And uh, you know what? That's okay. That, that's, that's who we are. It humanizes us, doesn't it? It humanizes us. So um, thanks for being brave and sharing. Thank you. You're welcome. I think, Troy, I'm looking at my time here, and I'd love to hear from more people, but I think I'm going to flip through and come back here just so we can finish up with what we have, if you don't mind. I think that sounds wonderful. And as we have done in past sessions, we will 
hang out after the recording ends. If anyone has questions for Shannon or Andy that you didn't necessarily want to capture on screen, um, I love the slide of final thoughts here. It's going to be great to have this resource available uh, in the blog post. And actually, since Dr. Ford, you're here and you've got lots of your students here, I'm going to give you a chance to say the closing words. Um, Andy, if you could just advance really quickly to the slide that has the next session. Um, anyone, again, I apologize, I didn't get your email out earlier today. I apologize about that, but I've got you on my list now. I'll send you a link for next week for staying connected as teacher writers, uh, which I think, Andy, you're back with us again next week with Jeremy. And um, then on the, the 8th, uh, Jeremy and I and whoever else might want to join, we're going to have kind of an open discussion and we'll model more of those synchronous learning best practices. Um, and all the rest of the slides you'll be able to see. I don't need to go through all that. So um, I wonder if uh, you have closing thoughts as, as you're thinking about your pre-service teachers. Uh, I keep saying Dr. Ford. I just want to say Amy, though, if that's OK. <laughs> if yeah. you want to you share really quickly and um, close us out here. And thanks again to Shannon and Andy uh, for your uh, contributions today. Yes, thank you. And um, one of the things that I'm sure my students are thinking about is for some of them, this might be the most polished and effective and um, well put together synchronous sessions they've seen because I don't think they've seen anything from me like this. And in part, just seeing how you navigate the technology so seamlessly and continue with a predictable structure throughout the whole session with pauses well-timed for interaction, using accessible tools like Google Docs to go along with this, which most people are familiar with. Um, but they've seen me struggle with like WebEx training, trying to get that to work compared with Zoom. And this week we're gonna try Zoom because my student Sam has offered to guide us through that. They have more experience with Zoom than I do. Um, so I'm really excited and looking forward to that. And so as you think about this session, Troy, you posed the question in the chat, like what do you notice about the facilitation and the time management and the balance? Um, and I think that's one of the things that my students, I hope will take away is being able to see that. And while I've aspired to do that, my lack of um, intuitiveness with the WebEx technology that CMU requires has made it challenging for a lot of people as well as just those are monster programs. So I think that's one thing that my students have finally seen a well done synchronous session. So I'm so humbled and grateful for that. So thank you. Thank you. And with that, I am going to officially call us to close and end the recording again. This was our sixth session. We have two more to go. We're so grateful to everyone who's come for multiple weeks and especially grateful to the CMU pre-service teachers that came today. We need you. We want to support you and we hope that you uh, continue to stay connected with us through the writing project. So again, we'll hang out after the recording's done. We thank again, especially Shannon and Andy, uh, claps, snaps, all those good things that we can give to the two of you. Much appreciated and we'll see you all next week. Thanks. Mm -hmm.